The following audio is from Christian Heritage Church. More information about Christian Heritage Church is available at chctoday.com. Hallelujah. Our hope is built on nothing less. Can you say amen? Be seated for just a few moments. I believe God wants to do something specific and personal for many in this room this morning. I love that song because it reminds us of where our strength come from, comes from. It reminds us that Christ is the victor. He is the champion. He has overcome the world. It reminds us, as Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 33, don't be surprised if you have trouble. But the good news is I have overcome the world. You know, we look around us today in our society and we recognize that Christianity in general, the church as a whole under the rank of Jesus Christ, is under attack. And when we think about the book of Exodus, it shows us very clearly that God chose to rise up to defend his people. God chose to rise up to bring victory to his people. Matter of fact, many times we look at what's going on around us. We see what's happening in Kentucky. We see what's happening with the Supreme Court last month. We recognize that so many uncertain uncertain things could occur in the next few weeks or months of this year, depending on who you're listening to and who you're putting your faith in. But I want you to know today I have chosen to put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who never varies, who never changes, who has never been defeated, and who always has the answer. I've chosen to put my faith in a living Lord who is able to overcome every obstacle, every circumstance, every sickness, and every disease, who gives us the victory time and time and time again. See, the problem in the church is many times we understand where our strength comes from, but then we turn away from that and we begin relying upon what we have and what we know. Can I tell you, we're wrestling not against flesh and blood. That's what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. The problem we have in the church often is we try to make our enemy somebody else. I try to put a name or a face to my enemy. I've come to tell you this morning, we have a common enemy. His name is Satan, and it's time for the church to rise up against him. Now, unfortunately, many times he chooses to use people to advance his way in his kingdom and to launch his attacks. But that person is not my enemy. My enemy is not flesh and blood. My enemy is the principality, the power, the rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Oh, I want the church to get this this morning. Yes, there is an enemy, but his name isn't Steve. His name isn't Yvonne. His name isn't Logan. His name is the enemy, the deceiver, the liar, the one already condemned to the pit. And it's time for the church to rise up and fight with the weapons God has given us to overcome the evil one. See, Jesus said it this way in John 10, 10. He said, the thief comes but for to steal, kill, and destroy. If you read that word destroy from the Greek, it has several different meanings. Two of those are to separate or to divide. Satan's favorite plan to bring trouble in the church is to separate and to divide. Well, I don't like what you said. I don't like the fact that Sadie worked that FSU jersey. Get over it. All you FSU fans, you can't stand the fact that Jose came in dressed like a Miami hurricane. Get over it. And guess what? I'm wearing the best colors of all. Boomer Sooner. I'm saying that to help you all understand, we often pick the wrong battles or the wrong adversary. In the church of Jesus Christ, we're fighting a spiritual battle. We need to understand that our weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down vain imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That's how we fight, church. That's how we fight. We don't wring our hands. We don't moan and groan. We don't worry about what's going on in our culture, but we hit our knees and we begin to pray. And we begin to believe that as we pray, God the Father hears and God the Father answers and God the Father dispatches power to come to our aid and to come to our rescue. Somebody say amen. Get it in your spirit. You need to quit fighting with your family and start fighting with the enemy. Fight with the devil. 
He's the one that you need to give a black eye to today. Don't you realize Jesus said he is already under your feet. The victory has already been provided through Calvary. He descended into hell, the grave, and he brought back the keys of life and death. And he declared himself to be more than a conqueror. And he declared you by lineage through his blood to be more than a conqueror as well. So church, I'm challenging you today. When you hear that great song, let faith begin rising up in your spirit. Begin to know and understand God is fighting for me. God is on my side. In the name of Jesus, I am more than victorious regardless of what the devil throws against me. You can stand firm in the face of a bad diagnosis. You can stand firm in the face of a difficult relationship. You can stand firm in the face of a job loss and economic uncertainty. You can stand firm in the face of accusation because you know my Redeemer lives and he will cause me to triumph and to overcome. We're in the book of Exodus and I'm just going to spend a couple minutes there and then we're going to come back and sing that song again. Yeah, I love that song. While while you're turning to Exodus chapter 7, next Sunday, 5 o'clock, a special prayer service. I believe that things are aligning in America so that the church needs to be driven back to a place of prayer. Several other churches are going to join with us from 5 to 6 next Sunday evening, and we're going to pray for our nation. I believe America needs prayer. The only answer for America is not not another politician, but the Son of God, Jesus Christ. We need to pray for our nation. We're going to pray for our families. We're going to pray for Tallahassee, and we're going to pray for Israel in this uncertain time. So plan to join us next Sunday evening from 5 to 6 o'clock. Exodus chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. God told Moses, look at me. I'll make you as a God to Pharaoh. Now let me stop right there and help you understand something. In the religious system of Egypt, Pharaoh was not a God, but he was the intermediary between the people and the various gods that they served. So it's interesting that when God said to Moses, I will make you as a God to Pharaoh, he was saying he serves in that capacity now, but he's going to serve as that intermediary to the true and the living God. Pharaoh will prove by his position that I am the God of the universe. That's pretty good stuff. It goes on to say, your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to speak everything I command you and your brother Aaron will tell it to Pharaoh. Then he will release the Israelites from his land. At the same time, I'm going to put up Pharaoh's back and follow it by filling Egypt with signs and wonders. You need to underline that in your Bible. Pharaoh's not going to listen to you, but I will have my way against Egypt and bring out my soldiers, my people, the Israelites from Egypt by mighty acts of judgment. And the Egyptians will realize that I am God when I step in and take the Israelites out of their country. Can I say we're living in a day and an age when our nation needs to realize that he is God. The only way it's going to happen is by God pouring out his power through signs and wonders. So many in the circle of Christianity have said that the time of God doing signs and wonders and miracles is dead and gone. I believe that this is the time for God to renew signs and wonders and miracles to prove his power so that all men will know there is a God in the heavens. I believe it's the time for God to do things that we haven't seen in this generation. For us to stand and say, wow, what a mighty God we serve. For him to heal cancer and sickness and disease. For him to rescue and save. For him to renew and to restore. For him to do mighty and wonderful things once again to prove his power. Because as you look at the parallels between ancient Egypt and modern America, you'll recognize that we too are caught. We're trapped in a system that is very much against God and anti-Christian. But God said, I'm going to prove my power. I believe the Son of God is declaring it yet today. I'm going to prove my power. You say I can't, watch what I can do. You say I'm unable, watch what I can do. Oh, he declared it years ago. My arm is not shortened. My ear is not deafened. I will attune to your cry and come to your aid and come to your rescue. It's time for somebody in the church to believe our God is able. See, God chose to prove his power to the Egyptians and to the Israelites, first by using, as we talked last week, broken people. Secondly, by pouring out signs and wonders upon Egypt. 
He said, Pharaoh's going to put his back up. He's going to oppose me, but I'm going to follow it up by filling Egypt with signs and wonders. Oh, will someone begin to pray with me? God, would you prove your power in America by pouring out signs and wonders? Would you one more time make the crooked way straight? Would you one more time let the voice of the Almighty be heard across our nation and people know and understand there is yet one God whose name is Jesus and he still saves. You see, we look at those ten plagues and we wonder why it happened. It happened so God could prove his power. It's the only reason he poured out those ten plagues, to prove his power. Now, what's interesting, when you study the history of Egypt and their religious hierarchy, they were a polytheistic. It means they served many gods. They served all kinds of gods of nature, gods of the animals, gods of the insects, gods of the river Nile. The sun was their god. They served all kinds of gods. And when you look at those ten plagues... God proved his supremacy over the gods of Egypt by pouring out those ten plagues. I mean, think about it with me for just a moment. Realize the first miracle was water turned to blood from the River Nile. They worshipped the River Nile. It was a source of life to the Egyptians. But God proved his power. Second miracle was the frogs. They worshipped all that animal kingdom and animal life. Reptilian life is really more like it. Amen? It's like worshipping an alligator. Who'd want to do that? Dumbest thing I've ever heard of. And then there were gnats, and then there were flies. Can you imagine? Frogs piled up in piles, the Bible says. Then here comes the gnats, and here comes the flies. Not a good day to be an Egyptian when God starts pouring out those plagues. And then they worshiped their animals, and God sent disease on the animals, and they died. And then it still wasn't enough, so he sent boils, and everybody in Egypt was infested with boils. And then that still wasn't enough, so he took the greatest God they served, the sun, and he darkened it for three days to prove his power. And then it still wasn't enough, so he took the firstborn from every family across Egypt. Now, the interesting part of this, and this is what I want you to hear this morning, is that in the middle of those ten plagues, the first three, his people, the Israelites, experienced those as well. Their water turned to blood, too. Their houses were full of frogs. They were surrounded by those gnats or those lice. They experienced those first three. You see, there's a lot of people in the church today who say, if I serve God, if God is on my side, nothing bad's ever going to happen to me. Can I tell you, as long as you're walking in shoe leather, you're a target. And when you name the name of Jesus Christ, there's an X on your back. There's an enemy advancing towards you. So you better determine right now, it doesn't matter if it's good or if it's bad. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to serve him and nothing will sway me. I'm going to set my face as flint to follow a living God. So the the Israelites went through the first three plagues. People say, why? Why? Same reason the Egyptians went through the first ten. To prove God's power to them. To put them in a position where they could receive his deliverance. He didn't punish them through the first ten plagues. He was preparing them for what he was going to do. He was causing faith to begin to rise in their spirit. He was causing their mind and their memory to recall all the things that they had heard years ago about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they were coming to the position where they could understand, hey, this God who's coming to deliver us, he's a pretty powerful God. He can do anything he chooses to do. He can overcome the Egyptians and overcome the Pharaoh if we will just allow him to do it. You see, when we come into hard times as a church, as a nation, so often we choose to look to worldly solutions. But difficult times are to drive us to our knees in prayer. We talked about it last Sunday. You remember? Paul said that thorn in the flesh that God gave to me, I prayed that he would remove it three times. But instead, it drove me to my knees. Read that in the message. That's what it says. You see, when we face difficulties, we need to turn towards God. We need to submit to God. We need to begin again calling on him, praying and interceding and asking him to move in our hearts and to move in our lives. Because I believe what we're praying today prepares us for the battle tomorrow. 
Listen, if you can't stand in the battle, it's because you weren't praying yesterday. You need to understand difficult times are coming to America, but God is still faithful. God is still just. God still honors his word. And when he said, I'm going to put my hand on you, he still means it today. When he said, I'm going to put a line between the Hebrews and the Egyptians, he still means it. When he said these things didn't occur in Goshen where the Hebrews lived, he still means that let God become your source and your protection to get today. Three things I want to tell you very quickly. When you're in a battle and things are dark, you need to understand God always keeps his promise and he will never allow you to be tested above that which you are able. But at the point, at that point in time when you need the help, the help comes to you. Three things when you're in that difficult spot, focus on God. Focus on God. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 10 says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous do what? Run into it and they are safe. Oh, when you don't know what to do, when you don't know where to turn, when you don't know how to attack, run to the Lord. For the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run in and they are safe. Focus on his attributes, focus on his power, focus on his grace, focus on his mercy. Oh, shut out the dim wits that are telling you something that isn't aligned with the word of God and hear what the Lord of God has already spoken in and over your life. Amen. Time to shut out that negative voice and hear the voice of the Lord. When you're in that battle, find scriptures that speak to your spirit. Write them down, pray them through, put your name in, the, in that scripture and say, God, this is your promise to me. I'm going to focus on you because the name of the Lord is a strong tower. You said the righteous run in it and they are saved. God, I am righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ. I have been washed. I am redeemed. Therefore, I can run to you and you are my strong tower. So focus on God. Number two. Ask someone to join you in prayer. Get a prayer partner. I'm telling you, there are some things that are too big for you to beat on your own. I know that me and Jesus are a majority, but sometimes I need some flesh and blood to join with me. Sometimes I need to hold somebody's hand and say, pray with me. This is too big for me. When you choose to find somebody to agree with you in prayer, great things happen. Read it. It's right there on the screen. Jesus said, again, I say it to you. If any two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Get an agreement. There's power in agreement. That's why we're doing the prayer meeting next Sunday night. There is power in agreement. And number three, when you go through that difficult time, know that God's with you. I love the way the prophet Isaiah said it. He said, fear not for I've redeemed thee. I've called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When you walk through the waters, they're not going to overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you're not going to be burned. You're not even going to have the flame scorch you. I love that. Matter of fact, think of the three Hebrews. When the ruler threw them into the fire, the only thing they lost in that fire were their bonds. They didn't lose another thing. Their clothes were not singed. Their hair was not singed. The only thing that they lost is what the enemy had put on them. Oh, come on, church. Hear it. Get it in your spirit. When God is on your side, run to him. Stand on his word. No. That you aren't going to suffer any loss. Only thing you're going to lose is what the enemy has put on you. And he's going to break it off, burn it off, and set you free in the mighty name of Jesus. We're in a battle, church. The church of Jesus Christ is in a battle. For the first time in American history, we're in a fight to the finish. We've known favor as Christians in America. But I've come to tell you this morning, that day where the politicians and the government show us favor is gone. And it's time for the church to dig down, figure out where your strength comes from, and get firm in the Lord Jesus Christ. Determine that it doesn't matter what someone says, I shall not be moved. There are churches across our nation today that are caving and giving in that are becoming pawns of the enemy. But I've come to tell you, we're not going to do that. There is still a standard that we choose to lift high. 
We will not condemn anyone, but we will offer everyone forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ because I believe it doesn't matter who you are, where you've walked, what you've done, there is redemption through Jesus Christ. He is able to take my mess and turn me into a message when I give it all to him. If we will build our lives upon the firm foundation that never changes, the word of the living God. God said to Moses, I'm going to fill Egypt with signs and wonders. I'm going to prove my power to a godless society. I'm going to remind a culture of people who have forgotten me what a mighty God I am. So I've came to tell you today, when we're looking at the events that are unfolding on the landscape of America, it's not the time to despair. It's not the time to fold our tent and run. It's the time to run the flag of Jesus up the flagpole and declare, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We will not be moved. We will not be swayed. We're going to stand in authority and in power for the name of the Lord is our strong tower. Stand your feet with me across this place. Thank you for listening to audio from Christian Heritage Church located in Tallahassee, Florida. Feel free to give copies of this message to others, but do not charge for those copies or alter the content in any way without permission. For more information about Christian Heritage Church, please visit us online at chctoday.com.